First of all, let's start out with Therapeutics 101. And if anyone can't hear me, just let me know because I uh, come from Arkansas. Over in Arkansas, we call the hogs. So I can project my voice very well. So just let me know if you can't hear. Therapeutics has, um, first of all, when we started Therapeutics in 1992, therapy dogs were not nearly as popular as they are now. So um, our name is a little confusing for people. The Thera in our name stands for Rehabilitation Therapy, not Therapy Dogs. And that really confuses folks. So Therapeutics started in 1992 over in uh, Mounds. Um, it's been um, an organization that's gone through kind of a lot of um, ups and downs, like a lot of nonprofits. We've moved a few times. We're at our new location now at the corner of 51st, or uh, Mingo, rather, and... Um, the BA, you know, where Car FX is at and all those fancy Camaros and Mustangs and everything. We're in that same complex. We just moved there in October, and we have a, um, it's a, it's a complex that is much more suitable to the type of training that we need to do. So Therapeutics has been around since 1992. Therapeutics started off training uh, dogs for individuals with physical disabilities. It's only been recently that we've added an extra type of service dog. Uh, to our program. We've always been a largely um, volunteer organization. Um, <coughs> I started at Therapeutics in 2010 and I think I was the first full-time staff person, is that right Barbara? And then um, DJ came on in 2012 and was the first full-time trainer, so or the second full-time employee of Therapeutics. So we've been a, a, a largely a volunteer organization for many, many years. We currently serve the entire state of Oklahoma. So even though we have an office or training center here in Tulsa, we serve the entire state. And over the last couple of years, we have seen more and more um, individuals outside of the Tulsa metro area uh, coming in and applying for our dogs and, and having an interest in having a service dog. And so I'm learning um, more and more about Oklahoma, as is DJ. We're, we're finding ourselves in some interesting little cities and interesting little towns uh, that I never knew existed. So it's been interesting. Service Dogs 101. There are, uh, service dogs is kind of an umbrella term. There are different types of service dogs that fall underneath that umbrella term. Most folks are very aware of guide dogs, dogs that work with individuals who have um, low vision or no vision. You also have the mobility assistance service dogs, which are most, most of our dogs are mobility assistance service dogs. This is Jenny, by the way. I didn't introduce her. Um, but Jenny is a three-year-old lab. She is trained to be a mobility assistance service dog. Mobility assistance service dogs work for individuals who have limited mobility as a result of different kinds of medical conditions, paralysis, MS, that type of thing. You also have uh, medical alert dogs, and that was the dog that, kind of dog you were talking about. There are diabetic alert dogs and seizure alert dogs that um, respond to an individual's oncoming crisis and then are trained to do some kind of specific thing to, um, to protect that individual that the dog's working for. It's really a it, pretty interesting type of service dog. Um, psychiatric service dog is another type of service dog that's fairly new. Uh, psychiatric service dog is, um, oh, I think the popularity really come about when, with the veterans coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq. But psychiatric service dogs have been around a little bit longer than that. It's just that they've not been as popular. Is there other types of service dogs that I'm forgetting? That's pretty much the gamut. Um, there are, um, a lot of folks are familiar with the Americans with Disabilities Act. There is a section of the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA, that does cover service dogs. Uh, the ADA addresses the definition of service dog and then addresses um, public access rights for service dogs. In 2011, the Justice Department decided that they needed to tweak their definition of service dogs. Um, Jenny's just going to get comfortable. Just don't, don't mind her. <laughs> if she starts snoring, I'll wake her up. But uh, otherwise, she's finding this to be a very comfortable carpet to lay on. Uh, 
In 2011, the Justice Department released a tighter definition of service animal. How many of you all heard of service ferrets or service snakes? I listened to a story one time on NPR about a service parrot. Um, in 2011, the Justice Department decided that only canines could be considered a service animal. In very rare situations, a miniature horse can serve as a service animal. But that's really the only two animals that uh, will be recognized as a service animal, a canine or a miniature horse. So if you see a miniature horse walking next to someone with uh, maybe a, a vest on, maybe some sneakers, it is legitimate. It really is a service animal. There are just, I, I've seen just only two service horses. I guess that's what they call them. Um, but most of the time, a service animal is going to be a dog. The Americans with Disabilities Act does not cover um, training standards, tra minimum training standards, um, any of that sort of a thing. The ADA also doesn't cover public access rights for individuals training a service dog. That's left up to the state. In the state of Oklahoma, we're lucky. Um, the, the law in Oklahoma regarding service dog trainers allows a trainer with an organized program to have the same public access rights as an individual with a disability. So that's why you see our service dogs in training all over the place. Uh, we are in, uh, well, of course our trainers have the dogs with them all the time. We're in schools, we're in churches, we're in restaurants, we're in movie theaters. Uh, Jenny did not enjoy um, the girl with the dragon tattoo. She found it to be a boring movie, she fell asleep. Uh, but you see our dogs everywhere. Uh, DJ likes to take our trainers out into different public settings, Bass Pro Shop, the State Fair. So you see Tulsa is very used to seeing service dogs in training out and about. Now, I'm, I'm kind of moving through some of this rather quickly. Later on, we'll have time for questions. I want to make sure you have the information that you want to have. But... Uh, I could speak for about three or four hours, and I know you all don't have three or four hours to sit here. So uh, I'm skipping over a whole lot, but, but feel free to answer questions later on. Let's go back to uh, the psychiatric service dogs. Therapeutics trains the emotional, or excuse me, the mobility assistance service dogs. With our program, veterans receive priority status for a mobility assistance service dog. But last year, we uh, received funding from the Order of the Eastern Star to do a pilot program training psychiatric service dogs for veterans with PTSD. Before we get too much into psychiatric service dogs, we first have to give ourselves a little bit of a foundation of information. There's such a thing as an emotional support animal. Over here, you have the emotional support animal. Over here, you have the psychiatric service dog. Now, an emotional support animal and a psychiatric service dog oftentimes get confused. Folks aren't quite sure what the distinction between the two are. An emotional support animal is a dog, or I guess it can be any animal, really, um, that makes a person feel better. Perhaps this person is in counseling, uh, seeking uh, treatment for depression, anxiety, PTSD, any number of uh, mental health issues. And that treating physician or treating doctor has said to them, you need an animal as part of your treatment. You need a cat, you need a dog. It'll help reduce your anxiety. Um, that's called an emotional support animal. It's an animal that helps to reduce a person's symptoms of their mental health uh, problem simply by being what it is, a dog, just hanging out, or a cat, or whatever it may be, just hanging out and being what it is. What gives a, a dog that legal definition of support or service dog rather is that the dog has been trained to perform very specific tasks that relate to um, the individual's needs uh, you know in, in terms of their mental health uh, diagnosis the training is really in the tasks that's really the, dis dis the distinction uh, the ADA states that a dog whose sole purpose is to reduce anxiety, provide comfort, reduce symptoms of stress simply by being what it is, does not qualify uh, for that legal title of service dog. And that's where a lot of folks get confused. 
Donna's back there nodding her head because we probably get how many calls a day on this very topic. Um, a lot of folks, you know, think that because my doctor told me to get a dog, that that's, ma that's what makes it a service dog. Now, an emotional support animal, an individual with an emotional support animal does not have public access rights. The Fair Housing Act allows for an individual to have a pet in no pet housing if it's an emotional support animal. So if you're living in a house or living in a, an apartment complex that doesn't typically allow animals, with the right documentation, a person can have that animal if it's working as an emotional support animal. Now, of course, with service dogs, and it talks a little bit about public access in your brochure, service dogs have full public access rights. And this is where we get some clashing because we'll have an individual who has an emotional support animal and they're in anticipating the uh, uh, ability to have public access rights with that dog. And that's probably where we get into the um, most um, involved telephone conversations with the people who call us because they're wanting to take their emotional support animal out and about and everywhere. Um, with the psychiatric service dogs, again, they're trained to to perform very, very specific tasks. And uh, with the dogs that we have, the psychiatric service dogs that we have that we're training for veterans with PTSD, they're trained in about, uh, I'd say, three or four different tasks that they, that they perform. All of the tasks that our dogs perform um, are directly related to the common issues that a veteran with PTSD has. For example, most veterans have difficulty walking into dark rooms um, or they have nightmares. Our dogs are trained to turn on lights. Um, they can walk into a dark room and turn on the light before the veteran walks in or if the veteran is, is having a nightmare, the dog can go and, and turn on the light. Um, I have one veteran who, if he just sees the, the smallest little thing through his window, he wants his light turned on so his dog will go and turn on the light for him. Um, our dogs are also taught to position, and some of these terms might be a little different than what you've heard. So, for example, Jenny here, you see how she takes up a little bit of space. Um, she's kind of all legs. A service dog that's working for a veteran with PTSD can position in, in a certain spots to create a physical barrier between a crowd or another person and the veteran. One of the issues that veterans with PTSD have is they don't want people getting too close to them. Um, having a dog there to create that barrier is just a really nice way to, to keep folks at a safe distance or at a safe distance that, at a distance that the veteran deems safe for them. Uh, I always wonder what's going on in the background because we have really cute dogs on our, on our uh, PowerPoint presentation. So usually when I'm talking and there's PowerPoint behind me, people start smiling and I think they're smiling at me. But in, in reality, they're smiling at the dogs. This is Samson. Uh, our dogs start wearing the vest at a very young age. And we'll go back to some of Therapeutics 101 here in a little bit. Yes? What is the presence of the We're going to talk about that, yes. Um, the, the ADA, I mentioned earlier that the Americans with Disabilities Act doesn't really address training standards or, or minimums of training. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act does not require an individual who wants a service dog to go through a program. They can try and train a dog on their own. They can work with a private trainer. Um, an ind or, or a business can be training service dogs for profit. We're a, Therapeutics is a 501c nonprofit organization, <coughs> but um, the ADA section that deals with service dogs doesn't state that a dog has to come from a program or from a nonprofit organization. Now, you mentioned something that's very, very important for the veterans. Most of the veterans who call us, I'd say all of the veterans who call us, have one particular goal in mind, and that is to get back out into the community, to get back out into their life. They want to go to their kids' soccer games. They want to do their own grocery shopping. They want to... Um, you know, be able to uh, be comfortable back out into the community. They want to go on a bike ride or whatever it is and be comfortable. The service dog that's working for a veteran with PTSD is um, 
is going to enable that veteran to do just that, to get back out into the community. He's, the service dog is kind of a conduit for getting back out into the community. But there is, in the beginning, that obstacle to get over. Uh, that's probably the one thing that gives most veterans cause for um, pause, I guess you could say, when they call us. You cannot walk into Walmart with a service dog and be invisible. You are going to attract attention. So one of the things that Donna spends hours and hours on with a veteran is um, helping that veteran navigate the community with their service dog. It's just sort of a little barrier to get through, to learn how to deal with the extra attention. So it's sort of a double-sided coin in a way. The dog is going to enable you to get back out into the community, but at the same time, the dog is going to create some additional stressors uh, in terms of being out in the community. But it's, it is a barrier that you can get through. It's difficult to try, when, when we have someone wanting to train a dog on their own, it's difficult for them to get past that barrier on their own. But if a veteran's working with a program like ours, we have staff people who will help them get past that. And they do get past that. Our very first veteran that received a, a service dog from us, he probably spent months just visiting with us before he ever even decided to apply for a dog. Um, I'd say about seven months after having his dog, though, he was doing presentations for us. So you do get past that barrier. Um, so, you know, that is kind of one of the challenges to having, for a veteran with PTSD, to having a service dog. The VA um, started out sponsoring programs that trained service dogs. Right now, the VA is kind of waffling on whether or not they support the validity of service dogs working for um, veterans with PTSD. So that's still kind of up in the air. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. There are, we're ADI accredited. ADI stands for Assistance Dogs International. There are, are currently about 93 um, ADI accredited service dog organizations across the entire country. That includes every single type of service dog. So you can just imagine only 93 accredited programs in the entire country working with every single type of service dog. That's not nearly enough. Um, we don't base, we see the, um, the good works that the dogs are doing for veterans with PTSD. So we're not relying right now on whether or not the VA sees the validity for service dogs. Um, the, the ADI and all of the ADI accredited service dog organizations, we do a lot of talking, we do a lot of emailing, and we do a lot of work with the VA to, to try and, and get them to support service dogs for veterans with PTSD. And, and we're all pretty much in agreement that no matter what the VA says, we'll continue to do our work in terms of training dogs for veterans with PTSD. Um, there is a new study that the, that the VA is sponsoring. I tried to pull up information about it to bring to you today, but um, website, government website's not working, seems to be kind of popular right now. So <laughs> I could not get the website to pull up the study. <laughs> um, and um, it pulled up all kinds of other things. So the VA is still certainly looking at veterans and um, PTSD dogs. For folks, how many of y'all have veterans in your family or, or friends, family that are veterans? Probably all of you since you're here. One of the reasons why it's important for the VA to recognize service dogs working for veterans with PTSD is a benefit that, they, that the VA gives to service dogs. If you have if you have a service dog working for you because you have a physical disability and you're a veteran, the VA will pay for certain types of veterinary care for that dog. So we're trying to get that benefit extended to the dogs that are working for veterans with PTSD. Um, let's kind of go back a little bit to therapeutics. I'm so worried about running out of time that I'm skipping around a lot and, and I want you to understand how therapeutics works. Like I said, there are about 93 ADI accredited service dog organizations across the country. Accreditation is entirely voluntary. It's not required by law. Um, it's not required by grantors generally. Um, but it's something that in 2007, 2005, 2007, 
our board of directors felt like it was important to pursue. So we are ADI accredited. Uh, a non-accredited service dog organization doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't a good organization. It just, um, there are some, it's a one red flag if you're looking at a service dog organization that's not accredited. All of these organizations kind of work a little bit different in terms of how they train and um, how they um, work with clients. With therapeutics, we have a parallel process. In, on one channel, we have the dogs that are being trained, and in another channel, we have the individuals applying for the dogs. So it's kind of a parallel process. We take our dogs in at the age of eight weeks. In our organization, the little things make up the big thing. So bef before we even start looking at the puppies that are coming into our program, we, start, we look at their background. When we're looking at puppies that come into therapeutics, we like to know, for as far back as we possibly can know, what the history is, the health and temperament history of that puppy is. If we like the history, we'll bring the puppy in for testing. Um, probably about, I'd say, 50% of the dogs that, that the puppies that we test for our program actually make it into our program. Uh, it's kind of like getting into Harvard. Um, we're looking for indicators of success. We are supported entirely by donations. Uh, the people who apply for our dogs are people who really need the services of our dogs. And so it's important to us that um, we have, first of all, as high a success rate as possible in terms of the number of dogs that complete our training and are actually placed as service dogs. And then once they are placed, we want that dog to work for as long as possible. Both of those are critical. Um, so we test the puppies. We look for indicators of potential success there. Uh, we choose the puppies that we want to come into the program. And uh, just like, oh, there's, <laughs> that's Adam. Uh, just, and at that small of an age, they start training. Trainees, training is in three categories, obedience, socialization, and then the actual tasks that the dogs are going to perform. Um, with our program, we are very uh, dependent, we depend on volunteers as trainers of our dogs. Some of the programs will have a volunteer that raises the dog for perhaps the first year or first 18 months, and then the dog goes back to the facility to finish out its training. With our program, our volunteer service dog trainers are at the paraprofessional level of volunteers, just like volunteer firemen are at a paraprofessional level of volunteerism. They have a great deal of accountability and responsibility. I often say that the volunteer puppy trainers or volunteer service dog trainers coming into therapeutics are enlisting in the puppy corps instead of the peace corps uh, because for two years they are going to dedicate their lives to training the dog. They come to class once, twice a week. They do formal training in their home every day and then their lives 24-7 are an open um, opportunity for training. If I go out to dinner with friends and the dog I'm training goes with me, that is training for the dog. So it's a real intense program. Um, the volunteers work with our, our trainer on staff, um, Donna. She does a lot of classes and she does, does a lot of 101. She works in partnership with our volunteer service dog trainers to accomplish that goal of, of training the dog and then placing them with individuals. That usually takes about two years. We have a few dogs that have been held back a year. It just happens. They have, a, they have some maturity issues. Uh, and so we have a few dogs that are training for three years instead of two years, but typically they don't go past the three years. Our, um, what we call career change rate is rather low. The <laughs> we like to say career change instead of failure or washout rate because it's, we don't like to see it that way. Um, the national average of service dogs in training that don't complete the program is around 50 to 60 percent. With our program, we're roughly 15 to 20 percent. We work very, very hard to keep that um, number of dogs that we're pulling from the program as low as possible. Uh, it's probably a source of sleepless nights for, for DJ. I'm trying to get in the habit of calling her DJ instead of Donna because that's what she likes. Uh, but um, it's, it's an everyday check-in on how the dogs are doing because we want as many of our dogs 
to complete the program as possible. The reason they're pulled from the program could be health, could be temperament. Some of our dogs, um, we may discover allergies, heart murmur, bad hips, different reasons why we may pull them for health reasons. Sometimes our dogs decide, you know, you chose this career for me, I didn't choose it for me, and I don't want to go down that road. Some of our dogs, we want our place service dogs to enjoy what they're doing. And every once in a while we have a dog that says, I've been doing this for about a year and I've had enough. Uh, some of them just don't enjoy the task or the work of service dog. Or sometimes they develop uh, less than um, acceptable behaviors, dog aggression, people aggression, that sort of thing. Uh, so they get pulled from the program. We have a tiered placement system. The dogs that we're pulling from our program, uh, we do our very, very best to keep them working in some kind of capacity. We had um, uh, Cody, um, a golden retriever, that we pulled from our program because he became dog aggressive. He turned out to be the first official court dog in the state of Oklahoma. He's over in Wagner County. His job is to sit on the witness stand and keep people comfortable as they testify. So we try really hard to salvage uh, some type of career for our dogs. Um, Barbara ends up working with some of our dogs who are pulled from the program and are now working as therapy dogs. So there's, the dogs still get to work in some manner. Um, the dogs that are completing training are sort of completing training and then we flip over to this other side of our parallel process. While the dogs are training, we have a system for uh, approving people for our dogs. The first step in applying for a service dog with therapeutics is to either call us or go online and fill out what we call a pre-application. We screen everyone who's interested in applying for one of our dogs to make sure they meet some minimum criteria. What we look for in an individual who wants a service dog are kind of three things. We look for the need, just how, how much of an impact will a service dog have in this individual's life. Um, if they tell us, you know, um, I have an aide that's with me 24-7 and that won't change, or I'm, I'm bedridden 24-7 and that won't change, then that tells us that a service dog won't have much of an impact in their life. So the first thing we look for is an impact of having a service dog. Second thing we look for is that individual's capacity to develop the skills necessary to become a service dog handler. People who have a service dog, and your family member can probably attest to this, have to almost become paraprofessional trainers themselves, just like the people who've trained our dogs. They have to be able to rem uh, memorize the commands. They have to know how to use the commands. They have to know how to anticipate problems. They have to know how to, to uh, make sure that they can either reinforce the dog's training or uh, make sure that the dog's not developing new skills that are less desirable. A dog is, is just like a child. It's going to learn something every single day. And it's up to the person who's handling that dog to make sure they're learning good things, not bad things. Third thing is we look for the person's financial, emotional, and physical capacity to care for the dog. Um, if you're a person who has a, a big phobia around dog slobbers, for example, and uh, you're not going to do well with a service dog. If having a dog pick up keys for you and hand them to you and then you kind of cringe and throw the keys down because they're covered in slobber, that's going to be kind of difficult then to work with a service dog. We tell folks that it's roughly, in terms of finances, roughly about $100 a month to support a dog, any dog really, and that's pretty minimum. You're kind of smirking because you're like, that is, that's low. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. See, I knew, I knew it was not my speaking. It's always the dogs. That is Cody, by the way. That's uh, Cody who uh, uh, ended up going to work as a service dog. You know, by the time you look at good quality food, uh, grooming, flea and tick prevention, heartworm prevention, all of the things that go into caring for a dog, it's not, it's, it's not uh, inexpensive. There is a program the International Association of Assistance Dogs and Their Partners. Longest title of an organization ever, I think. We just call it IAADP. That is an organization that, it's a membership organization that people with service dogs can enroll in and that helps them with some of those costs. But we still have to look at folks 
ability to care for the dog. So this is the parallel process. We look at, we do pre-screening, they apply. Those individuals who seem to meet some of the minimum criteria are interviewed. We have a blue ribbon panel of interviewers. Our, our medical selection committee, our client selection committee, is made up of occupational therapists, physical therapists, nurses. Um, Donna's on that um, uh, committee. They interview the individuals, and then it's after that interview that we determine whether or not that individual will be approved for a service dog. Typically, uh, as dogs are completing their training, we have a list of individuals who've been approved for a dog. And then we have to do the matching. This really is kind of like a marriage in a way. We're matching the right dog with the person that needs that dog. We're looking at needs, personality, lifestyle, all kinds of things. Once we make that match, then the dog and the person goes through team training, or you might think of it as boot camp. Um, they are learning how to work together. The individual's learning what their dog knows how to do. They're learning the commands, all of that sort of a thing. And it's roughly 80 hours. It could be longer than that. It could be up to 100 hours of training that that individual has to participate in. That takes place here in Tulsa at our training center. Some of that training also takes place in that individual's own community, however it is that they define that community. It could be the school that they work in. It could be the gym that they go to, however that's defined. So that's sort of a, our, our um, that's a little bit more to Therapeutics 101. Are we, how are we doing on time? Five. About five minutes? Woo fine and five minutes are two different things, George. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, let, me, let me rush through a couple of other things because I want to make sure you have your questions answered. Let's talk a little bit about service dog etiquette. What do you all think you do when you come across a dog in vest working for someone out in the public. What's your, what do you think you're supposed to do? Yeah. Hearing dog, that's the dog we forgot to mention. <laughs> you know, hearing dogs are not, they're becoming less and less um, popular just because technology is kind of replacing hearing dogs. So I always forget about hearing dogs. One of the, I think the point that you're making though is a good one. You never know why a person has a service dog. Some, some disabilities are, were visible, some disabilities are invisible. So really, the first rule of etiquette about, around service dogs is ignore the dog. Pretend it's not there. That dog needs to have the focus on the person they're working for. We also don't want to create a dog that's um, soliciting attention. Uh, you notice when we first walked in with Jenny, a lot of y'all wanted to pet her. She didn't necessarily come up to you and say, pet me. That's because she has been trained to pretty much just ignore everything that's going around you, going on around her, rather. So the, the first line of, um, the first rule in that line is just ignore the dog. Now, I like to talk about the three different ways of petting a dog, because this is where we usually get, in, get into some issues. Most folks think of using your hands to pet a dog, and so you think to yourself, as long as I'm not petting the dog, like this, then I am, I am following proper service dog etiquette. But there are two other ways to pet a dog. One of the ways is with your voice. This is what we get a lot of times. I'm not going to pet you, but you're so cute. You're so cute, cute, cute. That's, that's verbal petting. That's petting with your voice. And you saw that got her attention. The third way of petting a dog is just to look at them. I'm losing my Star Trek here. There we go. If you just look at them, and some people have, you know, really goofy look on their face when they're looking at the dog, that's another way of petting the dog. So I always tell folks, just because you're not using your hands and petting a service dog doesn't mean you're not petting the service dog. Don't pet, so that just when you see a service dog with its vest on, it's working, just ignore them. Don't pet them with your hands. Don't pet them with your eyes. Don't pet them with your voice. Uh, if you just absolutely cannot resist, then you're correct. You, you ask the person first. Some of our trainers are, have said they're going to get a t-shirt that says, I'm cute too, because, <laughs> uh, because folks, folks always notice the dog first before they notice the person. I go to a lot of uh, different rotary meetings and that sort of a thing. If I walk in without Jenny, they're like, you are... I've seen you before, but I don't remember your name. If I walk in with Jenny, they know exactly who I am. 
That's Jenny and your Susan. Jenny is like their key to remembering me. People always notice the dog. So if you just absolutely cannot resist petting a service dog, ask first and then wait for instructions. Don't go, hey, can I pet your dog? Pet, 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 pet. <laughs> wait for instructions. Because with Jenny, for example, I have Jenny sit and I give her the command visit, which means stay seated, stay calm, and let the person pet you, but don't get too excited about it. The person may say no. They may feel like, you know, 50 people have petted my dog today, and I just really want to buy my milk and get out of here. Um, just, ca just kind of imagine going into the grocery store to do your grocery shopping, and every other person stops to talk with you. Uh, so sometimes a person with a service dog would just like to be just like you, get in and get out of that grocery store. Um, so that's service dog etiquette. I want to talk real quick about how to support therapeutics. Uh, like I said, we are 99.9% .9 uh, supported by volunteers. We look for volunteer, puppy, uh, volunteer service dog trainers. We have volunteers who work as um, puppy sitters. The people, we may have a trainer who's going somewhere out of town and they don't want to take the service dog they're training, so we have specially trained sitters. Um, Jenny was uh, a joke about Jenny being in our HR department because um, typically when someone's training to be a sitter, she's the first dog they sit. She's kind of like the final stage of their training. Um, we have folks who help us with um, different public events. We have people who help us with special fundraising events. We have people who are sort of our ambassadors out in the community. Um, they invite us to the church they attend to speak or, the, or to their Rotary Club or whatnot. That's a really a big way that you can help therapeutics. It's just if you're involved in a church or, or a civic group or some other group, you have a bunch of friends who like to come over and, and um, you know, eat your special casserole, have a dinner party and tell them therapeutics is going to be here to do a little presentation before we eat. There are lots of different ways you can help therapeutics, but one of the main ways is to help us get the word out and spread the word. Uh, and of course, we exist 100% entirely on donations. Insurance doesn't pay for the dogs. The VA doesn't pay for the dogs that go to veterans. And he just laughed, so I know that there's a cute, yeah, cute picture behind me again. Um, so we rely 100% on donations. A, um, we have to get some updated numbers, but the last time we, we looked at our budget, something like 93% of your dollar goes directly to the program. We are a lean program. We don't spend a, a lot of money on overhead, that sort of a thing. Um, the majority of your donations go to our program. And one thing that you can look out for, how many of y'all have dogs that require grooming? A few of you. Um, we're in our new facility. We have the room to uh, have a small business of grooming dogs. So in the next few weeks, we're going to be um, opening up our grooming shop to the public, and the dollars that we earn through that endeavor will go into our program. So another way that you can help therapeutics is to bring your dog to therapeutics for grooming. I'm going to, we just registered with Amazon. How many of y'all are Amazon shoppers? Um, Amazon had, now has a new program. I thought everybody would raise their hand on that. Um, Amazon has a new program. You can go to our um, uh, Facebook page to get the website, or, or we'll, we'll be sending it out again, smile.amazon.com. It's, it's the regular Amazon website. It's just if you use that particular uh, URL to, to access their website, then a portion of your purchases goes to a, a registered nonprofit organization, and we have registered. So you can go to smile.amazon.com, buy whatever it is you're wanting to buy, you know, that leather jacket or whatever it is you're wanting, uh, and a portion of your proceeds can come to therapeutics. So there's all different ways that you can help us out. We love for folks to come and watch training. Um, that's pretty neat to have folks come in, they watch a training, we give them a little presentation afterwards. I'm going to hush now and, and ask for...